Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Did you feed your gut microbiome with some cookies? Yeah. Um, it's really an honor for me to speak to you today, so thank you for sticking around to the afternoon session, and thanks to the JGI for this invitation. I'm really honored. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the overarching research program that I have going on in my new lab at Michigan State. But before I dig into the science, I just want to thank my lab because I've been really fortunate to recruit a great group of lab, lab members from undergrads to grads to postdocs to technicians, and they help me, um, and together we pursue this research with high integrity, dedication, and also a lot of geeky science humor. So thanks to my group for that. Okay, so the overarching objective of my research program is to understand how microbial communities or microbiomes respond to disturbances. We want to understand the resilience of microbial communities. And resilience is an ecological term, and it concerns understanding how a community is able to recover from a disturbance after it's been shifted and altered by that disturbance. And when we think about resilience, there are lots of ecological aspects to that. We might think about the extent that a community has changed in response in response to the disturbance and the rate and pace of recovery from that disturbance. We can also think about things like alternate stable, stable states, which is when the community has been altered so much by the disturbance that it's unable to fully recover and assumes a different state entirely. When we think about microbiomes and their resilience, we're also interested in understanding how the diversity or structure of the community uh, is resilient in relation to its functions. And so we can imagine that functional resilience and structural resilience may be synchronous, but we can also imagine that functions may recover in a microbial community, but the structure may remain altered, and that's called functional redundancy. And so when we think about resilience in microbiomes, we're concerned with all of these aspects and trying to quantify them and move them towards a predictive science. So we think that understanding microbiome resilience is especially important today given the stressors of global climate change that our planet is facing. And essentially we want to move this ecological predictive science forward so that we can understand how microbiomes and the functions that they provide will respond to the global uh, stressors of climate change. We want to be able to predict how they're going to change so, so that we can um, encourage them to have functions that are stable. And the pie in the sky goal is to be able to manipulate these microbiomes and hopefully moderate their functions towards something that's stable and agreeable for our ecosystems. My research program has three arms. And each of them is supporting our overarching goal of trying to understand microbiome resilience. And the first arm is uh, theoretical ecology. And so we're very interested in um, using model disturbances and model microbiomes and, and understanding the drivers and consequences of their resilience. And the second arm here is very collaborative and interdisciplinary. We're working with a lot of plant biologists and um, agronom agronomists, excuse me, and we're interested in learning how to leverage the resilience of microbiomes to support plant resilience. And then the last arm of my research program is as reductionist as I'm going to get as an ecologist. We're using synthetic communities to investigate microbial interactions. And we want to understand how the biotic interactions among microbes in a community contribute to the emergent property of resilience in that community. So today, I'm going to be mostly focused on arm one and a little bit on arm two. And then I'm not going to touch on arm three, but my student John has a poster if you would like to go visit him. And he's also giving a short talk tomorrow on that topic. OK, so let's dig in. So this is my model ecosystem with my disturbance that I am primarily focused on for the first arm of my research program. This is Centralia, Pennsylvania. It is the site of an underground coal mine fire, and it has been burning since 1962. And so here is a sign that you might see if you travel to Centralia. And here is a, an aerial view of Centralia's downtown. This was taken um, in the late 90s. And this is after all the, all the homes had been raised and the town had been relocated. Most of its residents moved to New Centralia, that's its real name. Um, and what I'm showing you here is not the early Appalachian fog in Pennsylvania, um, but this is steam 
coming from the surface of the earth because there is a fire burning immediately below that in the coal seam. And I like to show this picture because you can see how localized the impact of that fire is on the ecosystem. Go one or two meters over and you have a perfectly ambient um, temperate um, soil over there as compared to this uh, site which can get hotter than 80 degrees Celsius. My collaborator has measured it as hot as 140 degrees Celsius which is pretty darn hot. And so we think that this system, um, we're using this as a model to understand the resilience of complicated microbiomes, specifically those inhabiting the soil, to a sledgehammer of a press disturbance. A press disturbance is one that's ongoing relative to the generation times of the community of interest. And here are the reasons why we think that this could be a good system. So first, we consider this to be a severe disturbance on those microbial communities. Uh, the surface temperature, we're not going into the mine and taking samples there because that's kind of dangerous. So we're just sampling the soil communities that are above the burning fire underneath. And these surface soils get really high temperatures. And not only do they become thermal sites, but they also are polluted with coal combustion products like arsenic. So you have these compounded stressors as a result of the fire that leads to this severe disturbance. Also, this is a press disturbance, so it's ongoing. It's been burning since 1962, and depending on which geologists you talk to and their estimation of the coal seams, um, it could be going on for another 100 to 300 years. And so um, this allows us to look at the long-term consequences of a severe disturbance like this on the soil microbial communities. <laughs> And so we can witness the multi-generational impact of these soil microbiomes to this disturbance and also their um, multi-generational recovery. Now let me tell you something about how the fire is moving. And usually I do a dance for this a little bit, but I'm like stuck at the microphone. So, so as the fire moves forward along those coal seams, and it moves forward very slowly, five to seven meters a year, it advances along the coal seams. The previously impacted soils of that fire recover to ambient temperatures. And so the fire moves forward, exhausts the fuel, and the previously impacted sites get to cool down, and they get to recover, at least in temperature. And so we can use this fire impact gradient as a nice um, spatial gradient to understand how those communities are responding to the fire disturbance, not just on ecological terms, but we're hoping on evolutionary terms as well. So we can see the intersect of eco-evolutionary processes in the soil response in Centralia. So this is a, an aerial infrared image of Centralia. This was taken in the early 2000s. The fire's not quite as active right now. This is courtesy of my collaborator, Tammy Tobin. But here we have two fire fronts, fire front one up this way and fire front two down this way. The origin of the fire is over here. This used to be old route 61. Uh, it was a thoroughfare, um, but then it fissured from pressure from the fire underneath and has since been um, decommissioned because it's no longer functional as a road. Um, up here, is an active part of the fire along front one, and it's still active in this area today. And so here are our sampling sites. We went out for the first time in 2014 after I started my new lab, and I have a cute little animation showing you how the fire progresses. Um, here's about where the origin is, and this is roughly aligned with the previous aerial image that I showed you, but essentially we have uh, sites that we collect that are currently impacted by the fire, meaning their temperature is um, above the ambient temperature typical for the seasonal um, time that we collect the sample, which is in October. We have recovered sites which were previously impacted by from the fire but have since recovered to ambient temperatures and we've chosen these sites uh, very specifically with research um, with information from the literature that we've researched because we wanted sites not that were just all recovered five years ago we want to include sites that were recovered in the 80s and recovered in the 90s and a couple that were recovered in the 2000s so we have a nice recovery gradient among these um, these yellow flags we also have a couple reference sites and so we have one reference site here above the cemetery this will never be impacted by the fire and never was. And then we have a reference site in advance of Firefront 1 up here. We're hoping that's going to eventually become hot as the fire progresses over the course of our time series. And so we're collecting this spatial gradient of fire impact every year. But as we collect annually, we're also going to have an idea of how the fire is changing at each of those sites because we go back and sample them annually. Um, you'll also notice that there are quite a few cemeteries in Centralia and that there, there's no fire underneath them. Um, a lot of people ask me this question, why is there no fire underneath the cemetery? And the answer is ghosts. 
no, that's not the answer. I just lied. The answer is because there are no coal seams underneath the cemetery. And so these are good locations to use as a guide when we're trying to refine our sites. We have our GPS and we go up there and we know if we're north of the cemetery, we're looking for these areas up here. So I'm going to give you two nuggets of insights that we've gotten from the Centralia um, coal mine fire to understand microbiome resilience. Remember, we're dealing with soil communities and they're being exposed to an extreme stressor, but soil microbial communities are notoriously or beautifully complex depending on the day of the week and how you're feeling about your lab work. Um, so we have a very diverse cohort of microbes that have the potential to respond to this um, disturbance. So here's some data that were published a little bit ago. This is from our, fourth, our first field sampling in Centralia in 2014. And this is simply a 16S ribosomal RNA V4 amplicon sequence analysis done with Illumina. And what I'm showing you here is a bar graph of diversity uh, measured as OTU richness, number of different taxa that we see in that site. That's on the y-axis. And here we have our samples divided into fire impacted, recovered, and reference sites. And the takeaway message here is the fire uh, decreases the richness of the site. And that's not unexpected because this is a, a very extreme disturbance. We're expecting it to be a, an environmental filter on these microbial communities and that not everybody is going to be able to handle that. Everybody meaning the microbes. Um, and so we have a decrease in diversity here, but we also see variability in these fire affected sites and their richness. And we also see that the recovered sites are kind of in between the reference and the fire affected. This is an ordination, and so each symbol represents a different microbial community sampled in a different soil along our fire impact gradient. And here, our um, dissimilarity, we're using weighted unifrax, so that takes to a, into account the different types of taxa that we see, as well as their relative contributions to the community, as well as the phylogenetic divergence of those taxa in those samples. So we found that this metric was really explanatory, most explanatory for our data. And so let's walk through what we can, what we can tell from these data. So first, here we have all our reference, or sorry, all our fire affected in red in this side, and we have all our ambient temperature recovered in reference on this side of the ordination. And axis one is explaining a lot of variability. And so we have a statistically significant difference between our fire affected and our ambient temperature sites. So we're seeing a shift in response to the fire. Another thing that we can see is that our recovered sites are very similar in community structure to our two reference sites here. And some of them are, are pretty, pretty similar, nearly identical in community structure. So this shows an immense capacity of the soil system to recover um, from the fire disturbance within a decade to a decade and a half. Another thing that was re really interesting about this analysis is that look at the spread of these fire impacted um, soils. They're basically explained by the second axis. And so among our fire affected sites, we're seeing a large divergence in the community structures in those sites, but they're all different enough from the um, ambient sites that that, that holds true. And when we looked at these data a little bit more carefully, what we found was that all of our fire impacted soils actually had almost identical membership. We were seeing the same taxa in all these fire affected soils. It was just that one fire affected soil had a different dominant member and the other one had a, had a different dominant member. And so they were different in their dom dominant memberships and not in their, in their composition, if that makes sense. And so they all pretty much have the same thing. It's just that somebody is more successful successful here than in here. So put a pin in that because that's going to be important. So um, around that time when we were getting these data back, we applied to JGI for a small scale CSP and they awarded us with 12 metagenomes. So we um, took a look into what the functional potential of these microbiomes were in Centralia. And um, we got those genomes back and we were so excited to analyze them. And around the time this paper had just come out and so we're like, okay, we're gonna do the great thing first and account for average genome size in our metagenomes before we even start to analyze them. So we did that. And when we did that, we saw something really interesting, which was this. And so here on the x-axis, I have temperature in Celsius, hot, cold. Here over here, I have average genome size um, from those metagenomes that we got back. And here is the most beautiful Pearson's correlation that I'm ever going to see as an ecologist in my entire life. Um, and it's statistically supported. And so what we saw was that the hotter soils, on average, had smaller microbial genomes than the ambient temperature soils. And we thought, gee, what's that? 
That's interesting. So we dug into the literature and we saw um, that there was some literature suggesting that thermophiles and other thermal tolerant bacteria and archaea tended to have small genomes um, when they had high optimum growth temperatures. And the same, um, the same paper suggested that one reason for that might be because cell volume is uh, restricting cell uh, genome size. And so maybe there's this um, streamlining towards efficiency in thermophiles to have small genomes to reduce the maintenance costs of their cell. And so um, we had actually counted cells under the microscope from our soils um, for this data set. So I asked my student Jackson to go back to those microscope images and measure the size of the cell. And he did it with a smile, really. It was awesome. And so he went back and he looked at the sizes of those cells from our soils. And indeed, we found a relationship um, between the average length of the cell and the temperature in which those cells were, were from whence they came. Um, and so that gives us a direct temperature between average genome size and cell length in these data set. So that hypothesis that Sabbath and colleagues put forward were supported with this highly complex soil, diverse soil microbiome community in the wild across an interesting range of temperatures that range from mesophilic to thermophilic um, soils. And so we thought that was really exciting to see that um, trait manifest in response to this extreme disturbance. So then we were like, well, maybe our Centralia metagenomes are just really weird for some reason. Let's take a look at some other soil metagenomes, use the same analysis to calculate average genome size and see how ours stacks up. And so that's what I've got here. We pulled high quality metagenomes from MGRAST and we selected them based on ones that had similar coverage um, to the metagenomes that we received from JGI. And here are Centralia metagenomes here and we can see that um, hot soils from Centralia on average have smaller genome sizes than other soils of comparable um, types. And so it holds true across a broad range of soils. And then we were like, well, what, what is special about these small genomes? Do they have any particular functional genes enriched or depleted that we should, um, we can use to try to interpret what the microbes in these hot soils are, how they're making a living, and what allows them to be adapted to that environment? So here I have a heat map. I know I hate them too. Um, but basically, we have cool sites up here. The color um, circle indicates the, the temperature of the soil. And we have our hot sites down here and our ambient sites over here. And the red means um, enriched and the blue means depleted. So these are standardized and these are all statistically supported. And something that jumped out of us when we looked at the functional repertoire of these soils and their hot genomes is that um, we had two particular functional gene categories that were consistently and statistically depleted in our hot soils. So one of those was two component regulation and the other one was antimicrobial production and resistance. And so we followed up on the antimicrobial production and resistance looking at the data in a couple different ways and trying to predict some biosynthetic gene clusters from those data and this is this is still upheld so our hot soils have a depletion in these particular functional genes and then we took our metagenomes and we were able to create some really nice um, high quality bins. We got 104 high quality bins um, from our metagenomes. And um, this is the phylogeny of those. We compared those genomes to genomes from the rough soil database to have a, a soil comparable reference of genomes. And um, why we did this is because we wanted to know if the thermal tolerant genomes that we were finding in Centralia, if they looked like other thermophiles or if they looked like other, um, other things with small genomes genomes that we could compare them to. And the answer is that it's nuanced. And so we saw some genomes in Centralia that were related to no, known thermophiles. And we saw some related to lineages that had no, um, no previous report of thermotolerant cells in those line, lineages. And so it was kind of a mixed bag, um, but gave us a lot of interesting things to follow up on. And so remember the divergence in the hot soils that we saw in Centralia community structures. They all have the same membership, but they have very different um, dominant members in those soils. And so we wanted to know what was driving that, because I have to say that results a little bit unexpected. We expected that the fire would come in. It was an extreme temperature. It would filter out organisms that couldn't survive. And that would, that would make a homogenizing selection on the community. So we'd be saying, seeing basically the same members over the different um, um, fire impact impacted sites. But actually, we didn't see that at all. 
And so our working hypothesis is that there were different um, resuscitations or different um, dispersal dynamics leading to the different trajectories in those fire impacted soils. And so we're taking this observational field study to the lab and we're doing a mesocosm experiment to um, interrogate that hypothesis. And so um, we're breaking down this experiment now. We're really excited about it. But basically, we've got some mesocosms that were inoculated with reference soil from Centralia. And we have a control group where we kept that at ambient temperatures, and we have a treatment group where we gradually ramp them up to Centralia 55 degree temperature, kept them there for a couple months, and then brought them back down. And then a subset of those, we added some starting soil back to them. So we're looking at the influence of resuscitation and dormancy dynamics, contribution to necromass or death, and also um, we're going to see if uh, these, these replicate mesocosms have the same trajectory. So we're sampling them over time non-destructively, and we'll be able to get an idea of that. So we're pretty excited about um, how that's going, what that's going to tell us about the mechanism supporting microbiome resilience to this sledgehammer of a disturbance. OK. I'm going to briefly um, touch on what we're doing with plant microbiomes. And this is work with the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, but basically, for this objective, we want to understand and leverage microbiome resilience associated with plants to support plant tolerance to stress in their environment. And um, so we're working with switchgrass and miscanthus, two uh, biofuel crops, perennial biofuel grasses. And we're working with the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. And our part of this very big center is to try to grow switchgrass sustainably on marginal lands. And we're part of a really big team. So the GLBRC has like, I don't know, 100 PIs. And we're part of one AIM. And there's like 10 research investigators on this AIM plus all of their labs. And so it's a highly collaborative and really dynamic um, team. And I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of it. Um, and so here are some of them doing field work. Um, we have this great replicated cropping experiment that was set forth by the GLBRC about a decade ago. And so we have miscanthus and switchgrass uh, in a replicated block design. And we have four replicates of each crop that we can sample over the growing season. Here we're focused on the phylosphere microbiome. And we're focused on that for two reasons. One is because um, these are perennial grasses. And so at the end of the year, the biomass is harvested for conversion. And we want to know if the leaf microbiome has any contribution to those conversion dynamics. We're also interested in it because there's a huge foliar pathogen of switchgrass, rust, and we want to know if the native microbiome can provide any support for either predicting rust or maybe mitigating its impacts on the crop. And so we have this nice replicated time series. Um, where we started to sample the grasses pre-emergence, we got bare soil, and then the grasses over time. We have two years uh, for switchgrass, one year for miscanthus, and this is a 16S ribosomal RNA gene amplicon analysis. And so two nuggets um, that we can, we can get from this analysis. So we, we want to understand these baseline dynamics so that we can understand when the microbiome is altered in response to stress. Um, and the first thing that we saw was that we have a very repeatable and synchronous trajectory in the leaf microbiome over time across crops and across years. And so what I'm showing you here is switchgrass from 16, 17, and miscanthus from 16. And the size of the symbol is correlated to the, the weak of sampling in the season. So a bigger uh, symbol means that we sampled later in the season. So we start here um, when the grasses emerge, and we have this nice directional trajectory. And um, if we run the statistics, they are synchronous across years for the switchgrass and across switchgrass and miscanthus for 2016. And so we were really excited about this because we had high degree of reproducibility among field replicates, among sample time series. And so um, that gives us a lot of hope and potential for predicting and managing these communities over time. We were also interested in identifying core microbiome members um, to prioritize for management. So we wanted to enrich these in the lab and start testing them, for instance, with interactions with the switchgrass and with the rust. And so to do that, we use an ecological approach by looking at occupancy and abundance of those taxa. Occupancy is simply based on presence absence. How often do you see a taxon in your time series? So for this particular graph, each of these little dots is a different taxa that we see in the switchgrass microbiome. And then this tells us, OK, so I sampled 12 time points. I see that taxon in all 12. And so that's an occupancy of 1 or 100%. So we're using two dimensions of ecological distributions to identify and prioritize that core microbiome. 
And if we do that, um, what we see is we find this core that I'm color coding in green. If we defined our core differently, like saying, oh, we just want the core that's unique to each crop or each year because we think that's somehow important, we would be blipping around in this area, which is actually in the rare biosphere and transiently detected. And so I, I, I show you this just to say that it's really important to think about defining your core in an ecological sense and with, um, with reference to the structure of your data set. So here we have this replicated time series and we want to prioritize taxa that we see across our replicates at the same time point. And so that's what we did. Um, a lot of these core taxa were shared across the grasses, shared across the crops. Um, and so that was good as well. Some of them had different um, dynamics across the different crops, um, suggesting some host distinctiveness. But some of them had identical dynamics across the different crops. After we got those core taxa, we performed a hierarchical cluster analysis to look at similar dynamics. And we found that the patterns in temporal beta diversity, so these overarching trends that we're seeing in the data series, um, were largely explained by the core taxa that we were able to identify. So 75% of our beta diversity was explained by these core taxa that we identified based on occupancy and abundance. And we could divide them into basically three groups um, that reflect the seasonality and the phenology of the switchgrass and miscanthus, where we have these red groups blooming in the beginning. We have a blue group that kind of blooms end season. And then we have some gray um, mid-season groups at peak biomass. And so again, um, we have a lot more of these data. And my, my um, research assistant, Kira, has a poster if you'd like to go check it out with some more details. But we thought that these data were really promising for the potential to manage these crops. We're seeing the same core taxa. There's relatively few of them. We're talking about tens, right? Um, a lot of them were able to go on the lab, so we're working on that right now and running some interspecies interactions assays. Um, and so because of this predictability of, this, of the season and because we can see this um, temporal dynamic that's very consistent across crops and across seasons, that means that we have the potential to manage these microbiomes and potentially manipulate them to our will. Um, what is our will? Hmm. All right, so um, yes, and John's going to be um, talking at his poster about microbial interactions, and he has a short talk tomorrow, um, so come, come cheer him on. I'd like to thank JGI. JGI has supported each of these arms of my new research program. They've supported my research in Centralia. They've supported my research with the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. And they've also supported a, a, a CSP with John to get metabolomics and RNA-seq data on our synthetic community. So we're really grateful. And um, I'm really happy to take questions. Thanks for your attention. That was was very cool. Um, so in the case of uh, Miscanthus and the other experiment, you were showing seasonal changes. So when it comes to uh, Centralia uh, experiments, what about potential seasonal changes in the richness and everything else that you're seeing? Because, for example, it could happen that during the rainy seasons, parts that were exposed to fires are going to be more prone to erosion. So can, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think that's a great, um, a great question. It is a temperate um, ecosystem, and so it does experience seasonality. We only have data from October sampling, and we go back every year in October so that we can kind of control for the seasonality. But one year, we deployed um, hobo thermal thermistor um, sensors into the ground in both our fire-affected sites that were venting, like actively steaming, and also in some of our ambient sites, because we wanted to get an idea of the range of temperature that these microbes are exposed to over the course of the season. And briefly, I can tell you that um, the fire impacted sites that were actively venting were always at least 15 to 20 degrees hotter than the ambient sites, though all sites had a fluctuation seasonally of about the same range. And so are there seasonal changes? You betcha. What are they as far as the microbiome response? We're not sure yet, but we're hoping we can go back now that the project is funded externally and sample seasonally as well. <laughs> 